Summons are a very unexplored part of Baldur's Gate. Sure, if you're a wizard, you might throw down the occasional Conjure Minor Elemental, and Scratch is always a nice freebie to summon, but what if you could only do damage with these? Is it possible to beat Baldur's Gate 3 by using only summons? Quickly, the rules. To make things a bit more spicy, I will be playing on Honor Mode, Lone Wolf, meaning that I am only allowed to fight using one main character. However, I am no sadist. At least not enough to let tens of hours go to waste on something dumb like this. So despite the enemies having legendary actions, I will still allow myself to reload saves if I ever die. Of course, any summons or temporary allies that are next to my portrait will be allowed. I will also disallow myself from doing any damage with my character at all. No matter if it's directly attacking or indirectly damaging foes, all the damage will have to come from the summons themselves. Although I will still allow myself to use heals and disables that don't do any damage. Alright, with that out of the way, let's begin. We start off as Will, for reasons that won't become clear until late in Act 2, but just trust me on this, it's very very necessary. Since Will always starts as a Warlock, we will have to make do with what we have until we can respec. The only summons Warlocks get access to at level 1 are the Cantrip's Mage Hand and Minor Illusion. Minor Illusion can't even be used offensively in combat, and Mage Hand is, well to put it politely, not exactly a powerhouse. With 3 HP and a 1 damage punch, the only real thing it can do is throw very light enemies for some very underwhelming but still extremely important damage. As for spells, since we cannot deal any damage ourselves, we can't even pick Armor of Agathis, and our only real lockdown option at level 1 is Command. This sure is going to be fun. Luckily for us, it almost seems like the developers had this stupid run in mind, as after waking up and taking 10 steps into the next room, we encounter this sentient brain. By passing a check, prying it from the skull, and very importantly deciding not to mutilate it, we get our very first summon in the form of Us. Us has an impressive 27 HP and can easily solo the entire first fight with his 4 to 10 damage claw attack. Lazel takes her leave as per usual and we free Shadowheart who does the same. Approaching the helm, Us keeps destroying everyone and I importantly land the one and only command drop we get access to. This allows the Mind Flayer to survive long enough for Us and the Mage Hand to deal with the rest. After getting this very seductive look from a Mind Flayer, we decide to peace out. Waking up, I straight away head to our camp and collect the pack containing a Hill Giant Strength Potion, letting us set our strength to 21 until our next long rest. This will, in combination with the human's carry weight based trait, allow us to collect the various corpses spread across the beach for later use. I sneak past the two intellect devourers as we are in dire need of stronger summons and speak to Asterion for our very first level up. Level 2 Warlock really doesn't give us anything, so I go for a level of Wizard, which will at the very least give us access to some more useful spells in the form of sleep, Tasha's laughter, but most importantly, Find Familiar. Find Familiar allows us to pick between six small critters who all do something different. And for pure damage output, we go for the crab for its two to five damage pinch attack. That also leaves the target with a debuff that will do an extra two damage at the start of their turn. Definitely way more prepared, I decide to head back and kill the intellect devourers. And so the time has finally come for our mage hand to prove its worth. I sneak up and start the fight by chucking one straight into the fire. After that, I fly up here to get out of their line of sight, and so all they can do is dash after us. This allows our mage hand to throw them right down again, turn after turn after turn, until the remaining one is low enough for our crab friend to take him out. We kill a dying mind flayer needing two attacks, I've never even seen the animation of it not dying immediately, and stupidly enough leave Gale to die as I watch my hopes of the perfect summons only run whittle away. We get some free XP from a few raiders and head over to the first grove fight. Here, we are basically completely useless. We can only cast a few commands, and our mage hand can't even throw the goblins as they are already too heavy. So then what's the strategy here? All we can really do is just run, as the goblins kill the humans and our summons. Cowering over here in this corner, we watch on as Sevlor single-handedly kills them all. With that done, we enter the grove and head over to Volo, who sells us the Whispering Promise. A very nice ring that gives any creature we heal a free bless for two turns. I grab the Parasite from this dead Absolute Worshipper before encountering the Dog Scratch. By succeeding a roll and giving him the scent to our camp, we will later be able to summon him as an alternate familiar. The Mask of the Shapeshifter lets us transform into Drow and bully our way through some goblins for level 3, all the way over to the goblin camp. 
Because we got Shadowheart killed before she could even give us the artifact, we get a free long rest here before continuing into the camp where we get branded and battered a little. With this done, Withers appears in our camp, finally letting us respec away from this useless Warlock class and into Ranger. Ranger not only grants us heavy armor proficiency, defense, and long strider, but also the Beastmaster subclass for our very own companion. At level 3, the only real option is the bear, as it is by far the most tanky, also having the highest damage output. The companions also get the free damage bonus from Hunter's Mark, letting them hit quite hard, and it just so happens that Damon sells us a bow with the free Hunter's Mark. Heading back into the Blight Village, we go down this wooden hatch and collect the Summon Quasit Scroll. Just for the moment, I take a level in Wizard, and importantly use the scroll instead of learning it to summon Shovel. We tell it that we are going to do some pillaging and murdering, which to be fair is the truth, and enter this door. After which we permanently get the find familiar cheeky quasit. Shovel is a familiar, and so will override any other one we may have. He, or she, is easily the best familiar in the game though, so it's nothing to be sad about. Not only does it have a free 2 turn fear, each short rest, and a not bad at all 4 to 7 damage claw attack, it also has a free permanent invisibility. This is absolutely insane, letting us start basically every single fight by surprising the enemies. The surprise condition does not let them act or move at all, basically giving us a free 1 turn stun on every enemy. Before leaving, we also make sure to pick up the Necromancy of Fey, which will give us access to a nice saving throw buff and one of the game's strongest summon spells later down the line. We cannot get Volo's Magical Eye since, as will, we already miss one, and so we continue on to the Risen Road where we enter this shed. Down the hatch and behind this locked door, we find the Abyss Beckoners, which will give all our summons permanent damage reduction to everything apart from psychic damage, at the cost of having them go mad sometimes at the start of their turn. Thankfully, this is an aura, so it can be toggled on and off as we see fit. With these upgrades, we head into the Warg Pens to free Helsen and murder a few children before they have any chance to get help. This fight has some very hard hitters, so I turn on the Mad Aura, which sadly backfires as Helsin kills my own bear. But he makes up for it by winning the fight all by himself. We have Shovel move this box to grab the attention of the ogre, letting me sneakily grab it before escaping for the Amulet of Misty Step. With that, we head into the Underdark, the easiest area of the game for a summons only run. I start by collecting Falara Luv, a weapon that has the Shriek effect, for a free 1d4 thunder damage on all attacks on enemies in its AoE. I get the Boots of Speed from this Dying Gnome, and buy the Amulet of Restoration, which, in combination with our Ring, lets us bless our entire party at will. Now for the reasons the Underdark is so easy. Glut. Apart from being an absolute beast himself, with 57 HP and a base 6 to 26 damage attack, he also has the Animate Spores ability, letting him resurrect any one creature that we make come across. I get body slammed by a bullet before surprising Finn Row and a hook horror. Of course it's not enough to simply murder and humiliate me as it returns, merging the fight with the other unsuspecting hook horrors. I manage to kill Finn Row before he gets a turn and get enough XP for level 4. To be fair to the bullet, it does a fair bit of damage before running but now we are stuck fighting 4 hook horrors at once. By blessing everyone and focusing one, I manage to take it down and reanimate it with Glut just in time for both Shovel and Ursa to die. The Hook Horrors have Pounce, an ability that lets them prone enemies, allowing them to use Multi Strike. And it just so happens that this fits perfectly with Glut, who also has Multi Strike. With these combined, we trade Multi Strikes with the remaining Hook Horrors, barely coming out victorious. Since we are going to be running around with Glot, we do not really need our bear friend, so with level 4, we respec over to Cleric for more heals with the life domain. Sanctuary, the best defensive spell in the game, can also be picked up here, alongside Spiritual Weapon, a pretty decent summon. The last level is put into Wizard, which lets us learn the Flaming Sphere spell. With our newfound power spike, we head over and take on the Minotaurs. And of course, Bullet joins the party. They really stand no chance against the various multi-strikes we have now, and the only one trying to ruin the party is Bullet. Minotaurs are basically just a better version of Hook Horrors, so I grab one of those instead. Jumping around Dwergar, we encounter Bullet for the final showdown. 
After a lot of proning turns and stunning him, we managed to bring it down, giving us the strongest summon in the game. It spite does a whopping 8 to 52 damage, and it also has an ability that only requires movement called Deadly Leap, letting it do some insane damage. With this newfound Absolute Beast, we take out the turrets guarding the Arcane Tower and approach Bernard. Like a lot of you pointed out, I use a Saucer Flower to incapacitate the animated armors before starting the fight. Bullet almost takes out Bernard right away. Glot gets wounded really bad though, and I cannot let him die as that would kill our killing machine. In trying to heal him, I stand a bit too close and get absolutely destroyed. Second attempt goes better as I halt Bernard, letting Bullet finish the job. In the basement, we find a lightning resistance ring and a staff of arcane blessing, giving anything we bless a lingering 10 turn bless effect that lasts even if we start concentrating on something else. We collect survival instincts from Umloom and cheese the spectator fight with shovel. During our next long rest, Scratch finally brings us his ball, giving us the ability to summon him. Now Scratch is strictly worse than Shovel, but we can always just summon him in combat if Shovel were to die. I failed to save this dwarf. At least we get two Misty Step Scrolls out of it. And it's time to finally do what Glot wanted us to do all along and take out the Dwergar guarding the ship. This fight isn't a problem either. I just cast Sanctuary on Glot and myself and let Bullet solo the entire fight. This, this guy is way too strong, man. After the fight comes a slight problem. Dot asks for our help in killing Spa, and we cannot really deny him, as that would make us have to fight not only him, who already is too strong to handle, but also the bullet. So for the first time ever, I side with him, and we are off to kill Spa. It's actually a pretty cool fight that I've never done before, but it turns into yet another bullet show, as me and Glot just watch on while it slaughters the entire colony. With that, the Underdark is completed. I head over and get the horn from Lump. Before pickpocketing Sevlor, getting a pair of gloves I should have had a long time ago. Since the Abyss Beckoners are a bit too risky to use, we can instead give our allies free Blade Ward anytime we heal them. We head back into the Goblin Camp, follow Glot to a secluded area, and drink a very unsuspicious potion. Waking up, we simply wait, and Corilla takes care of the problem for us. I use the Parasite for Shield of Thralls and jump down to the trapped spiders, ushering them towards the goblins. After that, I go get Halson from the pens and immediately get into a fight. Failing to kill this goblin, it calls for reinforcements, dragging Minthara and a bunch of other goblins into the fight. I summon our spiritual weapon and flaming sphere, but completely forget that it requires concentration and try to use heroism on it. <laughs> I'm so fucking bad at this game, holy shit. <laughs> I do have another one though, so it is fine. Minthara seems keen to not attack for some reason, as she wastes 3 turns on blessing and healing her allies. Using survival instincts on this spiritual weapon seems to bug the game out completely, as after its death, instead of resurrecting, it just remains there, soaking up more damage. Minthara finally starts hitting, knocking Halsin out of his bear form, which is absolutely perfect as he has Thunder Wave, allowing him to take out a warg and a goblin before transforming back. We knock out Minthara the turn after, and our spiritual weapon finally dies. She has a very nice pair of boots that prevents us from getting knocked around or prone while concentrating, which basically will be always. I start the final fight with the goblins and let the spiders out. Dragslin still needs to die, so I decide to merge the fight using shovel. And after a lot of goblin slaughtering, Dragslin manages to make his way over to us. Not that big of a deal though, as he promptly gets held personed and beaten to death. This fight gives us level 5, and thereby access to Animate Dead, which by all means isn't weak. It lets us either spawn a zombie, that can summon even more over the course of a fight, or, very importantly, a ranged skeleton. This is our first and only ranged summon so far. We go back to the hideout where we got the gloves, and use our fire sphere to blow it all up. before respecking back to Beastmaster. At level 5, all our companions get an upgrade. They're all quite good, but the boar is the one we're gonna be using. It gets an exact copy of Barbarian's Rage every single fight, and this also lets it attack using a bonus action, basically doubling its damage. We use our newfound boar friend to murder the paladins that are after Karlak, 
finally some decent damage numbers. And decide to help her, as the body armor we would get doesn't actually help us in any way. Besides, who would miss out on the opportunity of some cool horns? Heading over to the Grimforge, we collect a Mithril Ore and activate the Forge, before teleporting away. Time to take your advice and Omega Cheese Grim. I use enemy dead for the skeleton and walk over to this spot. Using the skeleton to shoot the valve, I activate the hardest fight in all of Act 1. Not only does Grim do some insane damage, but he also gets a casual 10 temporary hit points for one turn anytime he is hit. But since we're standing up here, there's actually nothing he can do to touch us. So we can just slowly, and I mean extremely slowly, whittle down his health bar, shooting the valve anytime the lava disappears. You know, it only takes us casual 40 minutes and 405 rounds. Jesus Christ, why do I do this to myself? In any case, he's dead now, thankfully, and we get the adamantine splint armor and the grim skull helmet which we can equip thanks to the ranger proficiency. I convince some Dwergar to fight for me and head over to take on Nier. This fight becomes really easy since we just have so many allies, even with them trying to sabotage us as much as they can. The Mindmasters go down without being able to control more than one Dwergar, and so does Nier, albeit after a few annoying procs from his legendary action. And so, we bring Nier's head back to the glut and finish off his questline. I ambush the quote-unquote sheep outside Ethel's house, who don't stand a chance against our bloodthirsty boar. Revealing Ethel's real form, we follow her down her basement and get level 6. Now is the time to go for the subclass you may have thought obvious to go for right away, Necromancer. The reason we don't take it earlier is because the level 2 effect really sucks when you cannot do any damage yourself. But the level 6 buff, now this is strong. It lets our enemy dead raise an additional corpse and gives them all additional hit points and damage. I give them all longsider and shields before heading over to this spot here. Right next to the Guidance Amulet, we find a crevice containing a bag. In the bag is a spider egg sack that can be thrown to summon 5 one-time use crag spiders. Using aid from another character, we can get their HP all the way up to 17 and our skeletons all the way up to 35. I very painstakingly bring them all down to Ethel one by one, free Marina with invisibility and use our Minstra's Blessing before starting the fight. Ethel has a legendary action that lets her spawn more copies of herself whenever a spell is cast in her presence. This range seems to be very small though, as we are free to cast Flaming Sphere here. Our skeletons, Shovel and Fireball, take out a few copies, as Shield protects us from the other's Ray of Sickness. With Ethel's copies dead, we lay into her with our skeletons, and she wastes a turn transforming into Marina, letting us do even more damage. At half HP, she goes invisible, but we can easily find her and bring her down low enough to end this fight. I take the plus one to Wisdom, as we mainly will be using Druid later on, and pick up Bitter Divorce from her workshop. By resurrecting Marina's husband and keeping the one for ourselves, it lets us, using an action, summon Connor for 10 turns anytime we want. He does a decent amount of damage and always comes with undead fortitude, preventing him from dying the first time he's reduced to 0 HP. The arguably other hardest fight in Act 1 is still ahead of us, the Gith Yankee guarding the mountain pass. I initiate the fight with Shovel and summon Connor and then upcasted Flaming Sphere without entering combat, also allowing me to call for Lump and his gang. After shooting a few arrows into them, the gifts show why they are so rough to fight, as they do some insane damage to Lump and his friends and hold person me. Thankfully, one of them runs into a bunch of opportunity attacks, but the leader, Sarth, single-handedly murders Lump and his crew. I manage to take out the remaining gift, and Sarth is dumb enough to run back and fight Connor, perishing the turn after. Lastly, it is time for the Spider Matriarch. Using one of the skeletons, I destroy the majority of our eggs and use Feather Falling and Enhanced Leap to go after the last ones. Shovel succeeds in not getting spotted, surprising the spider whilst the matriarch is over her web. This lets me shoot down the web, dealing a nice 37 damage to her without even engaging in combat. And so instead, I engage by killing the smaller spiders and her legendary action just hits a wall. I successfully land a stage fright, making her miss me and conveniently stand over another web. The matriarch saves a fear and finally manages to hit me, but it's too little too late as our skeleton finishes her. Right next to her, we find a dark amethyst, which we insert into the necromancy of Thay. 
Reading this book, we fail a saving throw, which curses us with disadvantage on wisdom checks, easily removed with remove curse, but also gives us the forbidden knowledge buff for a free plus one to ability checks and wisdom saving throws. And with that, we are officially done with Act 1. The mountain pass and Act 2 awaits. Heading towards this crash, we run into a lady looking to smuggle out a kid. Normally I'd be against it, but if we help her, we will get a really useful item down the line. Destroying this wall, I use a trick we will be reusing a lot with Connor. By walking into the room, the encounter with the invisible Grimishka starts. This surprises him, but after his demise, they are now completely visible. And so, I can use Shovel to instead surprise them myself. Using Connor as a meat shield, this fight goes without much trouble. And I move on to cheese a couple of Gith guarding the entrance from above. Killing some eagles and a few kobolds. We make it to the crash. However, we are nowhere near ready to take them on yet, so instead I move back to the Grimforge and use the elevator to officially enter Act 2. Instead of taking the normal route, I decide to sneak up on Karnis and his gang. Convincing him that the lantern is mine, I get them to walk off into the curse without any protection. It will become apparent soon enough why we have to do this. Anyways, I pick up the lantern and already we have protection from the shadow curse. Killing a couple of Shadowhounds, I discover a trick that can basically trivialize any encounter in the game. You see, there is no limit to how many times I can summon Connor, and each time I do, he is counted as a completely new unit, meaning that he has his actions fully back. This means that as long as the turn order is right for it, I can summon Connor, hit one time with him, and then just resummon him again, repeating the process over and over again until any fight is won. This is quite boring to do, and it takes a very long time. So I I won't be using it anymore, but it's still a cool thing to know about nonetheless. Making it to last light, we buy the usual Cloak of Protection before running over to Moonrise Towers, where we find Karnit and his squad turned to undead. Making sure to scurry around them, I approach Moonrise, where Mizora appears, telling me that I need to rescue a devil that got caught by the Absolute. Speaking to Sorel, she gives us the key to Balthazar's room, and within, after interacting with the rightmost bookshelf, and placing a heart onto the altar, a secret room opens up. Inside, we find a ritual circle that normally, if interacted with using Gale, will let him combine a dead pixie found on the table with a broken moon lantern to create the shadow lantern. But since I am dumb and left Gale to die in Act 1, I cannot do this. However, most of you seem to agree that it's alright that I console commanded in, since the mistake was just for me being done. So I did just that, and bada bing bada boom, we have the shadow lantern. It comes with the Conjure Shadow Wraith spell. Using it on anything that used to be alive summons a shadow. It is resistant to nearly everything and goes invisible as soon as it moves. With our new ally, I decide to challenge the As of Patch 6 heavily buffed Shambling Mound. It now has a legendary action that does 3 to 30 damage to anything that ends its turn near it, alongside letting it instantly kill whatever it has restrained. With its 200 HP, it is slightly out of reach for us currently, so instead I decide to just go for its smaller, easier to kill allies. And after a couple of turns of feeding it corners, I decide to retreat after reaching level 7. This level gives us access to level 4 spell slots and also gives us the Conjure Minor Elemental skill, letting us summon either an Angry Dwarf, a couple of mod methods, or my preferred one, these Ice Boys. Since we have level 4 spell slots, we can now upcast Create Undead to raise 4 Undeads instead of 2. We do only have one level 4 spell slot and I don't really feel like waiting for level 8 to be able to cast both, so I head back over to Moonrise. Entering the basement, I hold person the warden, killing her before she can react at all. And on her corpse, we find the spell crux amulet. This lets us restore any one spell slot once per long rest. And if you want to restore my faith in humanity, why not hit the subscribe button? It is completely free, and you can always just unsubscribe later. Running into the gold goblin, I convince her after a few rerolls that she doesn't need to be here, and she just implodes off screen. We run into Raphael, and after shooing him away, kill a pack of Kuatoa from up on top of this cliff. Now it's time to take on the Gauntlet of Shar. I immediately rush over to Balthasar's chambers, but both the fight outside his room and the fight with him inside of his room are way out of our league. So to solve this, I use invisibility, making sure to sneak past the event trigger and open his door. 
This lets me merge combat between these two fights right away, and we go straight into the longest fight in the game. It lasted over an hour, so I won't bore you with all the details, but in short, Balthasar was destroying people, I was definitely there, and there was a lot, and I mean a lot, of summoning going on. You know, just a casual plus 15 people outside of what can even fit on the screen. And so, after around 30 minutes straight of fighting, I managed to bring down the big crusader. And another 30 minutes after that, I managed to bring down Balthasar and his big boy brother Flesh. What an absolute massacre. On his corpse, we find the reason we had all entered here in the first place. The Circle of Bones. It counts with Animate Dead, and gives any allied undead, which almost all of our summons are, permanent resistance to all physical damage, as long as they're within my reach. This is by far the best helmet in the game for us. I quickly solved the three trials of Shar, and move on to challenge your gear. This fight is as exciting as it gets. I tell him to go kill himself, because trust me bro, and he just listens. No wonder Raphael was able to trick this guy. I unlock the way over to Night Song, but we are far from ready to do that yet. And so instead, I head back over and purchase the Darkfire Shortbow from Damon. It grants us resistant to fire and cold damage, and lets us cast haste for free one time per long rest. It is time to deal with the rest of the Thorm family, starting with Thistlebald. He can just like the gold one be talked to death by simply succeeding a couple of sleight of hand and performance checks. Moving over to the House of Healing, I kill one of the sisters and get level 8. But before using it for anything important, decide to take care of Malus and his little cult. Malus works just like the other Thorms and I get him to happily slaughter his sisters and then himself. With level 8 now in our disposal, we're going to do something a bit unexpected. That is respecking into Paladin of all things. I make sure to become a Paladin of Devotion, and after putting 3 levels into it, spend the remaining 5 levels on our old friend the Beastmaster. But why do we want Paladin? Well, to answer that, we first need to break our Oath, which is exactly why we picked the Oath of Devotion. To break this Oath, we simply have to kill any innocent bystander. With our Oath broken, the Oathbreaker Knight shows up, and after speaking to him in camp, we are now officially an Oathbreaker. Since we're level 3 Paladin, it gives us the Control Undead action, letting us use the power of our Oath to subdue any undead creature with a level lower than us until long rest. But even so, because we are no longer wizard, our lineup of summons are only these four. So this undead had better be good. And great news for us, it is. Remember how we forced Karnis and his gang to wander out into the shadows? Well, it turns out that any creature that gets turned into a shadow-cursed undead is counted as an undead, and therefore we can turn Karnis into our own personal bodyguard. He has 220 HP, an aura that gives any allied creature Feature, including himself, an additional 1d6 psychic damage on all attacks, and a legendary action that lets him do a huge amount of burst damage should anything within his aura die by an enemy. He also deals a very balanced amount of damage himself. The only sad thing about Karnas is that he cannot be healed, so currently he is an insane asset to us, but he will just last a couple of fights before running out of health. With Karnas now at our side, we easily take out the fight with the shadows outside the morgue. Getting some weird looks in Last Light, I also go down into the basement to pick a fight with the Mean Locks. Hasting Karnas, he casually one-shots this one from 63 HP, and after a few turns, deals with them all. Mostly by himself. Heading onwards, we enter the basement of the Mason Guild, and ambush another bunch of shadows. This fight is not easy, and would definitely not be possible without Karnas. They all have, just like our Shadow, resistance to basically everything. Normally you would just need to deal some radiant damage. But none of our summons can actually do this. Karnas gets extremely bullied, but I still manage to finish off the fight using Shovel as a sacrifice to trigger his legendary action. At this point, he is quite low, so I decide to just end him myself. After paying the 1000 gold fine for regaining our oath, I respec over, finally, to Druid. Putting 17 points in Charisma, since we got plus 1 from Ethel, I go for the Circle of Spores subclass. Making sure to grab Dual Wielder at level 4, we get our first unique Druid ability at level 6, Fungal Infestation. This gives us a couple infestation charges every long rest, letting us raise up to 4 Fungal Zombies. They do a fair bit of damage by themselves, and any target they attack are infected 
which upon dying will also become a temporary zombie for us. Level 7 once again gives us Conjure Minor Elemental, but also the highest DPS summon we have access to currently, by far, Conjure Woodland Being. It summons a Dryad that can itself summon a so-called Woodwode every short rest, has access to our first actual damaging crowd control, which, since some AI in this game is quite dumb, can be very effective, and after buffing its weapon using a bonus action, can pull off some really good damage numbers. Spore Druids also get Symbiotic Entity, letting us spend our transformations on a huge amount of temporary HP twice per short rest. Level 8 gives us another feat, and I decide to put it into Heavy Armor Master. The only bad thing about going Druid is that we lose Necromancy, and thus can only summon 3 Skeletons instead of 4, but aside from that we are now way stronger, with 3 Skeletons, 4 Zombies, a Shadow, a Dryad and her Woodwode, Shovel and our 2 Methods. All of these summons are quite weak in terms of hit points by themselves, but this can be solved by casting 8 on them using another character, with the current level giving them all plus 15 health. Since this consists of me and 13 summons, that's 210 extra health. With our now very tanky team, I decide to finally tackle the crash, starting off by bullying this trader. You know, a casual 14v1, that seems fair to me. After taking out the other guards chilling in the corner, I loot her corpse and find the Amulet of Branding. It lets us once per long rest brand an enemy, making it weak to any physical damage of our choice for one attack. This might not sound very impressive, but it can lead to some very high damage numbers. And it is one of the first ways we have to actually increase the amount of damage our summons can do. I continue on to the hatchery and convince the egg keeper to let me take his precious egg. Trust me man, I wouldn't just give it away to some smuggler. Entering the doctor's office, we convinced her to let us use her special tadpole extractor. Things don't go to plan though, as after succeeding a few saving throws, instead of getting rid of it, we awaken it, getting the awakened buff. This will come in very handy as we don't really have anything to spend our bonus actions on. I give the doctor her well-deserved reward and head onwards to challenge one of the Kithrax. Forgetting that she has fear, she manages to fear almost all of my summons, but luckily I manage to save it, letting me hold person her for a quick kill. Only thing left to do now is kill the Inquisitor. This fight doesn't actually start until we either talk to him or hit him, so I am free to spread out my summons however I want. Since our Dryad is by far our hardest hitting one, I begin by hasting it and hit the Inquisitor with Shovel. He has a legendary action he can trigger twice per turn whenever he or an ally is hit by anyone. It lets him summon a sword with a fairly chunky amount of HP that hits quite hard. Even with these though, they are still severely outnumbered. I use Bludgeon the Weak and get a nice 40 damage hit in using my Dryad, followed by an Entangle, before killing him the turn after. With the Inquisitor down, his swords disappear with him and it's just a matter of time before the remaining Gith also fall. After the fight, some big lady threatens us, getting really angry that I don't know who she is. And on my way over to the Blood of Lathander, I managed to somehow do this. I couldn't find any way out of this, so it's time to run all the way back around. Anyways, I collect the Blood of Lathander and head back, giving away the Gith Egg to Eshter. Now it's time to once and for all tackle Moonrise. But before heading over there, I make sure to open the secret way down to grab the 3 plus 5 temporary stats and anger a few sentinels. I start this fight with a fairy fire that I managed to land on two of them. These sentinels are not pushovers though, as they smite shovel and one shot Connor. Thankfully, they all seem extremely set on killing me in particular, instead of my summons, as they tank 5 opportunity attacks just to hit me once. I evade a smite and surround the very same one, managing to kill him. At this point I was certain that this fight was in the bag, I even got a nice entangle off, but then out of nowhere this guy pulls out a spirit guardians. Thankfully this damage is quite low, but AoE damage is definitely the biggest weakness we currently have. I managed to break his concentration and finish the fight a few moves after. Returning to the gauntlet of Shar, I enter the massive pool of water and arrive at Night Song's prison. Heading down to the bottom I free her and return to take on Sorel and her literal army of soldiers. 
Oh boy, that's a lot of actions that needs to be taken. I feel like I'm going to be here for a while. By far the scariest enemies in this fight are the adepts in the back. They can all cast Hunger of Hadar, a very strong, continuous AoE damaging spell. Since they are so far in the back, it is quite hard for me to at all hit them, but for now we can at least prone them with the ice methods, temporarily stopping them from ruining us. My Dryad gets its spike growth counterspelled, allowing me to land a fairy fire on Zarel. This makes it very unlikely for any of our summons to miss her, but this big ogre decides to almost kill itself in order to stop me from concentrating. Sorel gets off a nice cone of cold, and the zealots show up, deleting Jahira in a single turn. This means that we are already in a very bad spot, and so to not instantly lose, we will have to just kite them backwards, hoping that they willingly kill themselves on our spike growth. Zarel goes down just in the nick of time, but one of the adepts manages to get a hunger down. This forces me to go all the way down there and attempt to break his concentration with a hold person. Thankfully this succeeds and I make sure to finish him before he can break free. I get some help from the Harpers to finish him off and to be fair to them they are actually doing a pretty good job. The Zealots just don't seem to ever run out of smites though and they take out most of my melee units before the other adept uses another hunger. This time I fail the hold person but my dryad and skeletons still manage to bring him down. I heal it using a transfuse health twice, and now, with most of the dangerous ranged units dead, it's just a matter of kiting them all backwards, forcing the enemies to walk straight through the spike growth. After that giant clown fiesta, I realized that there is still one summoning item that I have yet to get. So returning to last light, I come across he who was. He needs our help finding some old ledger that this woman had, which we do right next to what remains of Thistlebold. After returning it to him and helping him torture a already dead person, he awards us with the Raven Gloves. These gloves lets us summon Quoth the Raven, which sadly is a familiar and a very weak one at that, but it's always an option, so better getting it now than regretting not getting it later. I quickly take care of the Necromites guarding the roof and reach level 9. This gives us access to level 5 spell slots and the Conjure Elemental spell. It has 4 possible summons, all of a different element. For example, the Fire one has a multi-attack and can throw fire in an AoE. With level 5 spell slots, we can now also use our Animate Dead to summon either a Flying Ghoul or a Normal Ghoul. But since we are no longer a Necromancer, this will only give us one, so sticking to the three skeletons is definitely better. Lastly, before confronting Kethrick, I head over to his bedroom and find a letter from his long gone wife. This lets me, as I confront him, try to persuade him away from fighting us. Which actually seems to work, that is, until the stupid night song shows up, making him change his mind last second, fighting us after all. This fight has two really scary aspects to it. The first one is Sustera. As I got teleported up here, with all my summons in a single place, she can easily destroy any chances we have of winning by fireballing me just once. So killing her is top priority. This goes very well and she dies without even getting a move, but here is where the second, even worse thing about this fight kicks in. You see, Kethrick has an aura around him called Legion of Bones. This raises an incubation egg that at the end of its turn will spawn a necromite in its place. Oh yeah, by the way, all the Necromites has a 10 health Armor of Agathus shield just to make things even more fun. Somehow the skeletal egg created from Sosdera hatches without even entering combat, it's a bit bullshit but okay. A Night Song goes in, managing to land a nice smite on Kethrick. He smites her back, almost instantly killing her and uses his deadly orders on me, making all the Necromites target me the following turn. The chance our summons have to hit Kethrick is absolutely minuscule at this point, so yet again again it will be crucial to land a fairy fire. But even so, thanks to the fact that he has resistance to all physical damage, the damage we do when we actually manage to hit him is still really small. Kethrick downs Aelin and one shots one of my fungal zombies. Here I get to learn that the incubation, for some reason, is counted as an item, so our zombies can't even attack it. Thankfully, at this point it does not really matter, as our water elemental lands two good damage hits letting me bring Kethrick down low enough to trigger the cutscene, in which he bodies Aelin and escapes away with her. I finish off the remaining Necromites, 
and loot Kethrick's big chest for the Ring of Exalted Marrow. Temporarily, this is the best option we got, as it gives us an ability called Exhort the Risen, which works exactly the same as Command, except on Undead. Following Kethrick down the hole, we enter the Mind Flayer colony. There is no turning back now. There are three things we have to do down here, preferably without losing any of our summons. The first one is in the morgue. Here we run into a very old friend, us. To get it free, we have to get the key from Chop. And well, it just so happens that he walked into the wrong neighborhood. After releasing us, it gives us both the ability, summon us, but also the item, summon us. This is important as we can use the ability before a fight and then use the item during the fight to resummon it without even using an action. Us has a really solid 55 HP even without aid and a ranged ability that lets it deal some pretty good damage. Moving on to the Mind Flayer pods, it just sounds too risky to open them as I really need every summon I have, so I just walk straight past them and find Mizura trapped in a pod of her own. Here comes the whole reason why we are playing Will in the first place. After releasing her and succeeding a persuasion check, she rewards us with the Infernal Rapier. This rapier gives us plus one to spell save DC and has the ability Planner Ally Cambion. This level six spell summons a very bulky Cambion. It has resistance to most things and a nine to 56 damage ray of fire. Finally, we are getting some summons that actually do something. With these two upgrades, I sneak past the undead waiting in the laboratory, solve the puzzle and collect the waking mind. Slotting it in here lets us purge the mind and gives us permanent advantage on all intelligence saving throws. It is now time to approach Kethrick for the final time, but since this fight is going to be really, really hard, I want to be as ready as humanly possible. So before using the elevator, I use the one free long rest we get here to refresh my fungal infestation charges. Normally reusing a summon that is already out will simply just replace it, but that is not the case for specifically fungal infestation zombies. So by killing these four unaware cultists, we can raise another four zombies. That has quite the army we got now. Activating the elevator, it is time for the final showdown. Using an invis pot, I start the encounter by freeing Nightsong, and since we convinced Kethrick to give up earlier, we can now yet again persuade him into repenting. This lets us skip the entire first phase with him. Starting the fight against Merkel right away. Although this is both a blessing and a curse, as Merkel right off the bat uses Call of the Damned, doing some huge damage to all of our summons. With his 390 HP and resistance to most things, this fight will not be easy. Starting off, I land a fairy fire on him and hit him with my water elemental. But after seeing just how pathetic the damage from one of my strongest summons is, I started getting quite worried here if this at all would be possible. And to make things worse, the one mind flayer here used uses an insane mind blast on all of my fungal zombies, eliminating four of them. Using confusion, I managed to confuse Merkel, but he still hits the correct target just fine. At least he decides to frighten his own mind flayer. The Cambion and the fungal zombie finishes the job, and Aelin lands a very important smite on Merkel. Merkel will, once he has fallen below a certain health threshold, call over Necromites and feast on them, regaining a big portion of his health pool. So to stop him from doing this, we need to use Darkness. And I just happen to have a singular Darkness arrow available. I managed to do some not too shabby damage and land a crit with my Dryad. But the time is ticking and the Necromites are really starting to add up. Merkel takes out a Skeleton and Connor and deletes our Cambion and my final two zombies go down to Necromites. As it's been three turns, the darkness from the arrow runs out and I make sure to recast darkness. But at this point, I barely have any summons left and my damage is really lacking. So deciding that my only chance is to end this within three turns, I drink a haste potion and resummon my dryad and water elemental. Dame gets in some very needed bits of damage and tossing a haste potion on my dryad it manages to land another huge crit before dying. And so with 14 HP left, I summon in a flaming sphere and it, together with my elemental and us, manages to just barely bring down Merkel. That was way too close for comfort. 
collecting Catherick's Netherstone, there is just one more thing to do. Deal with the Gift Patrol protecting the way to Baldur's Gate. Compared to Merkel, this fight is a joke, but I do get to show off the Dryad's true potential as it crits this one for 104 damage. Not too shabby. With them out of the way, we collect the Herakneer Bracers, giving us access to Telekinesis, a spell that will let us throw our summons into action, and take the path over towards Baldur's Gate and Act 3. As per usual, the first to stand in our way are the Gif, and since none of my summons follow me through the night, I am forced to just run past them. The fake long rest does not actually refresh any of our items either, so we are significantly weaker than we normally would be for the battle to come. Still, this fight is not that bad. All the gifts can be affected by whole person, and thus I just have to keep spamming it each turn. And since all the gifts just go straight for me, our summons, despite their small numbers, are able to slowly whittle them down one by one. With the Enhanced Parasite, we now gain two very powerful abilities. The first one is Mind Sanctuary, creating an area for three turns in which all of our summons will be hasted. It has to be placed with care though, as anyone moving out of it loses all movement speed for the rest of their turn. The other ability is a transformation called Displacer Beast. It works like any druid transformation, granting us an extra 84 hit points, and has an action called Illusory Copy. This ability lets us summon a copy of ourselves that attacks anyone which enters its radius. We also get a bonus action called Displace. It works by teleporting ourselves and another target, leaving behind a copy. Normally this would deal damage to the targets, meaning that I'm not allowed to use it on enemies, but we can use it on our own copies, letting us spawn up to two each turn. And while their damage isn't the highest, and they only last three turns, the fact that each one can tank a full 85 damage, and we can create two per turn, is a very substantial upgrade. I bought the Cloak of Displacement for a bit of extra dodge, and moved on to the lower city. First stop here is Mystic Carrion. To get there, I headed straight down into the harbor and killed a few fish people that attacked. This gave me level 10. Leveling Druid any further won't do anything for us, and soon enough we will want a full respec anyways. So for now I just put the one level into Wizard. By taking the back way into Carrion's mansion, we can skip all the other steps and immediately confront him. He sells arguably the most powerful item in this entire run for us, Armor of the Spore Keeper. While we have the temporary hit points from Symbiotic Entity, it lets us spread Bitterbang spores, not usable since they deal damage. Timask spores, also not usable since they also do damage. But most importantly, haste spores. Just like Mind Sanctuary, anything that enters the spores over the three rounds it's there will get hasted. Unlike the Mind Sanctuary, there is no movement restrictment after leaving. So effectively, it just doubles all our damage. Aside from selling us the armor, Carrion also wants help finding his lost servant, which can be done just up the road in this little house. Of course, I have no real reason to help Carrion and decide to betray him and help Thrombo instead, as he will reward us with the only real ring that does anything for us. In order to do Thrombo's questline, we need to kill Carrion, but if we were to just go and fight him straight on, we would be in big trouble, as he is basically just immortal. So to get around this, we will need to walk around the city and destroy all of his body parts. The first two can be found in the sewers, right next to the Undercity Ruins waypoint. I send in Connor to trigger the surprise encounter and use Shovel to surprise them instead. This fight is quite annoying. Anytime we cast a spell of any level, it will do 3 to 18 necrotic damage per level to us. Not only limiting what I can do myself, but severely prohibiting my strongest damaging summon, the Cambion, from doing his thing. The only real way for me to get around this is to immediately go into my Displacer Beast form, as its abilities don't count as having any level. And after creating a whole bunch of clones, I managed to just barely outlast the mummies. And just behind this hidden door is Carrion's brain and Liver. The third piece of carry-on can be found down in a cellar by the graveyard, and the last one is inside of Thrombo himself. With all the jars destroyed, it's time to take on carry-on. He has an ability that lets him take control of any undead we attack with, and although he is damageable now, he is still completely immune to all physical damage. Meaning that there is no point in attacking with most of our summons since they cannot harm him and he will just take control of them when they do. Thankfully, Carrion is a mummy, so he is very vulnerable to fire, and therefore by summoning the fire version of our elemental, and using the devastating fire attack from our Cambion, combined with the haste spores, I was able to kill him before he could get any moves in. With Carrion down, we are now free to attack its minions however we like, and it's only a matter of time before they also fall. 
Now for the reason we did this fight in the first place. Thrombo shows up and rewards us with the Crypt Lord's Ring. It lets us use a level 6 version of Create Undead to summon a mummy. It has 93 health all by itself, deals a good amount of damage, and if the target is frightened, can multi-attack for a massive 16 to 66 damage. It's time for the location that almost all my builds seem to need to visit, Sorcerer's Sundries. Since this run has a serious lack of actual useful rings it can use, I decide to just replace the Ring of Exalted Marrow with the Ring of Regeneration from Roland, also making sure to buy a scroll of Conjure Elemental here. Time for the Lorokan fight. This time, we will actually need to pay attention to the mechanics of this fight. Loroakan can counterattack anyone that hurts him with an attack that deals damage based on however many of his elementals are still alive. So going straight for him is just not doable. Worse than that though is the fact that all of my units spawn in the exact same location after entering, letting his elemental and himself take out most of them before they even get a turn. Since we can't straight up go for Loroakan and he has so many AoE attacks, our only real hope is to somehow distract him with displacer beasts. Dame gets in some good damage and I do get to counterspell at least one of his AoE attacks. Big emphasis on one of them. Eventually Roland dies and Roakan gets surrounded enough to feel the need to use his AoE attacks on our displacer beasts. The elementals manage to bring me out of my transformation but it's already too late as two of the elementals are dead and Roakan basically is all out of spell slots. So after just a few more rounds the last elementals die and I hold person Lorokan to finish this fight. I should probably have tried doing that a bit earlier. At the bottom of the tower, we collect Marco Heshkir, not for its offensive capabilities, but just for the fact that it's a free level 6 spell use. The real upgrades are not here though, but down in the vaults. Just next to the portal, there's a hidden room behind this chest with a book. Reading it gives us the scroll of Bestial Communion, and this scroll will be extremely important very shortly. Continuing on to the maze doors, I enter the Silver Hand door, followed by the Evocation door, and finally the Wish door. On the other side of this door is a lever, pulling it opens El Minister's door, and inside of it we find the Tharkiet Codex. It curses us, and after curing the curse, we will now, at the start of every long rest, get a free 20 temporary hit points, which is useless since we have symbiotic entity anyways. However, it also has another lesser known capability. By reading it, we can now finally interact with the necromancy of Thay again, and after passing a DC 20 saving throw, we get the spell Dance Macabre, an extremely powerful spell that summons four ghouls to fight by our side. They are uncontrollable and sometimes the AI is a bit dumb, but it's still a massive upgrade. Due to them being ghouls, they are also immune to going mad from our demon spirited aura, and by putting six levels into necromancy, the Dance Macabre spell now raises five ghouls instead of just four. Now with six levels into wizard and the remaining going towards druid, I still needed access to level six spell slots in order Order to use the scroll we found, so I just walked around killing a few people until I reached level 11. Since we only have 6 levels in wizard, we don't actually get access to conjure elemental or to conjure minor elemental anymore, which is why we needed the scrolls. We can now also finally learn the summon diva scroll. It creates a diva with 136 HP that can use wrathful smite every single attack. Sadly, it cannot coexist at the same time as our cambion, so it's time to say goodbye to him. But at least this means that we can re-equip Falar Aluv. Also with the level 6 spell slots, conjure elemental can can now be upcast to instead create a stronger Myrmidon. They are all very powerful, but the air one is my personal favorite. It gets an electric flail that can stun anyone it attacks for two whole turns. Finally, with level 6 spell slots, we can now upcast Animate Dead to level 6 and summon in another 4 flying ghouls, meaning that we now have 9 ghouls in total, each one having a chance of paralyzing any target they attack. This, combined with the Myrmidon, easily lets us permastun most of the encounters in the game. There is still one final item upgrade available for us, and it's inside Gortash's personal room. To get to it, I simply went in the back way and used invisibility to sneak past all the guards. Inside his personal chest, we find the Helldusk Boots. These let us, once per long rest, succeed any saving throw we would fail using our reaction. Very nice for keeping our concentration. Last thing to do now before taking on the final fights of the game is getting level 12. And what better way to do so than heading down under Worms Rock and collecting the free 5000 XP that is just waiting here. Heading over to rescue Volo, our new summons get to shine as they stun and paralyze everyone. 
With level 12 and thereby level 6 in Druid, we now get back the fungal infestation charges to resummon our 4 zombies. And now, finally have created our final lineup of summons. Using the level 6 spell Hero's Feast and an upcasted level 6 aid gives us an absolutely absurdly tanky team. In total, not even counting myself, they have 1622 health. Time for the Steelwatch Foundry. The first couple encounters on the way there stand no chance whatsoever. Remember, we can basically just stun anyone, and even if they were to get an attack off, they still need to deal over 1600 damage somehow. The Hellfire Titan himself cannot be surprised, but it can be both stunned and paralyzed. And so, after 6 attacks, I successfully managed to paralyze it. I cannot overstate just how overpowered it is to be able to paralyze or stun something for 2 turns. Paralyzing something doesn't only stun it, it also gives each attack towards the target a 100% chance to hit and guaranteed crit, letting me burst it down with the rest of my summons in a single turn. With the foundry down, it is time to take out Gortash. I of course start the fight with Shovel and get him to tank the brunt of Gortash's initial damage. Very timely, he decides to head over to this corner and using the Displacer Beast form, I am able to create a wall of summons, preventing anyone else from helping him. Gortash enters his second phase and does a whole bunch of nothing and unfortunately for him, he is not immune to the effects of paralysis either. At this point, the ghouls are just carrying this whole run. Anyways, with no point in killing the rest of his crew, I just take my leave and head over to Saravok. This time I thought that instead of fighting him, I could just become an unholy assassin. This way he just gives us the amulet without us needing to do anything, and we also get the bonus of killing the annoying elephant, so that's always something. With the amulet in hand, it is now time to take down Orin. I thought that this fight was going to be as easy as the other ones, as Orin only has 12 unstoppable charges and I had upwards to 50 attacks each turn. However, it turns out that she is harder to hit than expected. And even worse than that, the ritual that is ongoing does not just grant her unstoppable charges, but in honor mode, it will put a condition on us every turn that immediately kills us at the end of our turn unless we ourselves kill someone. But if we killed someone, the whole point of this run would be ruined, so somehow I needed a way to end the ritual on turn 1. None of the AoE spells I had would do it though. Confusing them did nothing, moving them with black hole did nothing either, and while our ice methods could make them slip on ice, the chance of everyone falling was not high enough. I was in real trouble now. How could I possibly stop them all from channeling the ritual without using any damaging spells? After thinking for a while, I remembered that there is still one ability on our air Myrmidon that I had yet to use. It creates a massive silencing storm that hurts all entities inside of it each turn. This had turned out to be way too clunky to use, since my summons normally would just run into it. But in this case, it was perfect. After being silenced, the cultists just stopped channeling the ritual, so with a mere 2 actions, I was able to end the ritual and after that Orin stood no chance, dying on the second turn. All that was left now was taking the boat over to the Netherbrain. When in the upper city there is no turning back and there is no access to our camp chest here either, so I just had to hope that there were corpses laying about and well, all I can say is I've never been so thankful to see murdered civilians on the street. Since I couldn't bring any of my allies here either without using them in combat, I would have to settle with a shitty level 1 aid scroll, since wizards cannot learn it. Skipping right past the many enemies waiting for us, it is time to take on the Netherbrain. The first step was somehow getting my summons all the way over to the portal without having them get murdered by the big dragon and the mind flayers. I did have one hold monster scroll that I was able to use to freeze the dragon, and with the mind sanctuary I easily had enough damage to kill him even through his 500 HP. Our next objective was to simply open the portal into the brain, and I easily did this by stunning all of the mind flayers and using a globe of invulnerability. Annoyingly, since the emperor had rolled lower initiative than me, this would mean that I only had 4 turns to kill the brain instead of the usual 5. But even worse than that is that apparently summons cannot use the portal at all, so without any other choice I had to leave them all behind and follow the emperor in. Here I was, with a mere 4 turns remaining, and with a very limited amount of actions, I now somehow needed to end the brain without doing any damage myself. I started off by casting my haste spores, and with them was able to resummon the diva using our final level 6 spell slot. It managed to do a fair bit of damage itself, 
and the Emperor used his one high damaging spell. This would not be enough though, as with half health remaining I still needed some very big bursts to be able to finish this fight. Here's where I remembered that the ghoul summoned from Dance Macabre upon death bursts for a huge amount of necrotic damage. So all I had to do was position them away from me next to the braid alongside the ice methods as they also do the same and then hit the brain, causing it to kill all the ghouls blowing them all up for around 100 damage. And with that I was able to barely finish it off with a mere 4 HP remaining. So yeah, turns out you don't need to attack at all. Simply just letting your minions do it for you is more than enough to finish this game. Thanks for watching guys. In my